Okay, with the research out of the way, because I'm a geek and I have to talk through the research, let's start to focus in on what are the characteristics of effective online learning. I think one of the most important places to start with is organization and structure. Um, and these are just some comments from uh, students talking about how well organized the class is, how clear it is, um, that expectations were well communicated and things like that. So, um, and, and you can see even some uh, things in here noted, like a grid in the syllabus. So putting together a schedule, a weekly schedule that just says, here's what you should read and watch and do and when things are due so that students can track everything and then having everything very neatly organized and very clear in the learning management system so that learners know where to go, when to go there, what to do. That includes providing a lot of directions and things like that. But we know that structure is very important for online learning. In fact, in some ways we can get away in uh, in the classroom instruction with a lot less structure or you know some less structure and some less organization but in online learning you really have to have things very organized and very structured and usually that means a lot of front end um, development before you even deliver the class on day one that's a big difference between classroom instruction and online instruction um, for online, we do a lot of the work at the front end. So for example, for this workshop for five days of it, the vast majority of my work for the workshop really occurred um, before the first day of the workshop in terms of pulling everything together, recording it, putting together uh, the schedule for things, mapping out how, how are we gonna do things? When are we gonna do things? What sequence do I want all of that in? Um, what questions do I want you to ask? And then getting all of that built in the learning management system or in the LMS. In this case, I use Canvas. Um, and then also creating documents and videos to help you see the structure and the organization so that you as the learner knew exactly what to do. So <clears throat> there's a saying in real estate of location, location, location. And I really think in online learning that the uh, that your mantra should be organization, organization, organization. And in addition to that, um, not just being organized, but communicating that out. So communication, communication, communication. So keeping things organized as a way of communicating to students. Here's what you need to do, when you need to do that. Also sending them updates, sending them emails, keeping them connected. Um, these are really two of your most foundational principles for online learning. In addition, uh, or as a uh, corollary to that really, um, engagement is also hugely important. So again, here we've got some quotes from students just saying like, you know, when the professor's actively involved, it makes a huge difference. Um, hands down, one of the best experiences. Um, I'm incredibly impressed with the level of interaction that I've experienced, both with the instructor and with fellow learners. I've been blown away by the sheer amount of time that they spend giving feedback, hosting live classes, interacting on forums, and dealing with emails. Um, I think that breaks it down <laughs> into the different ways in which we engage with our learners. So this gets us into a really cool body of research that we're going to go into a little uh, in more detail um, in a subsequent video, but I want to introduce it to you right now. The types of interaction. I've mentioned this already. I think if you leave with nothing more than this, this is the best organizer for how to design effective instruction. This is research that comes from online learning, and I think it's a fascinating body of research because um, in studying how to do online learning effectively, I think we identified some principles that really apply generally to effective instruction. So here we're looking at um, learner to content interaction, learner to learner interaction, and learner to instructor interaction. And if you design your course around those three ideas, how am I gonna facilitate these three different types of interaction and map those three out, you will have a high quality course. 
And in the planning guide I've given you, there's a whole section dedicated to this with a range of ideas. You may have ideas that uh, I don't even have noted there um, and you generate some really creative thoughts, um, which is great. Like go, absolutely go beyond uh, what I've got there. <clears throat> but the learner to content um, are really the strategies that we typically use for getting our learners to go beyond just reading or watching. How do we really get their minds engaging with the content? So quick summary, this is kind of a researchy way to summarize this. Um, you know, we used to, originally we thought, well, these different types of interaction impact learning outcomes. What we really discovered is that learner to learner interactions and learner to instructor interactions are all about facilitating learner to content interaction, which makes so much sense if you think about it, right? Like the feedback, that you give to a student about their learning is both um, a learner to instructor interaction, but it's an interaction that helps facilitate their interaction, their cognitive interaction with the content. Same thing with things like peer reviews or, or other things. So, so what are some quick examples? For learner to learner, that may be like discussion boards or live discussions in class. It may be peer feedback. Maybe you have them doing group work. I know students don't like group work, but time and again, we see that it's effective. Um, so it's, I always think of group work as like um, your vegetables. You may wanna eat ice cream, but you really need some broccoli <laughs> or some carrots in there as well. Um, back channeling, just a very quick side comment on this. Back channeling is when a learner will turn to another learner, and this happens all the time in the classroom, um, where maybe they'll turn to another learner and say, hey, I didn't understand that. Did you, or did you read that? Or did you get that note or whatever? Um, those interactions are very important. It turns out that 75% of the time when our learners are interacting with each other, um, they are really interacting with each other about the content. And so these learner to learner interactions reinforce the learning around the content. So a lot, sometimes I hear folks say, you know, they're very stressed about the students chatting with each other and they seem off topic and things like that. Yeah, they're definitely gonna be off topic sometimes. You know, again, um, roughly uh, uh, around 25% of the time they are off topic. But most of the time they're actually supporting each other in the learning process. And they're trying to build that social network. And in fact, we know that when students don't have access to these back channels of information with other learners, that's when they start to feel very isolated and alone. Um, they may feel cut out of the learning process. So for example, you know, with girls in STEM, um, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, um, a lot of times they'll say that they feel like it's a chilly environment for them. Well, that's because they're cut out of these peer interactions and in particular these back channelings where learners are sharing information and supporting each other. So we want to make sure that we support um, healthy forms of back channel. So I will admit, I leave the chat room open, I leave it on um, so that learners can connect with each other. And you may even wanna create like a dedicated discussion room or something where the learners can connect with each other and it's not guided or directed by an instructor. Um, I'm sure you may feel you still wanna monitor it or you need to monitor it and that's fine. But how can you create a space that is for the learners to connect with each other? in a safe and, and supportive environment. Learner to instructor interactions include like strategy focused feedback. Um, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a bit. Providing virtual office hours or opportunities to do like um, student teacher conferences, having live sessions, um, responding to students in a forum or in a asynchronous discussion sending out weekly email messages to students or sending individual direct emails. And there, I mean, there's other things that you can do here, but these are pretty common um, ways in which learners and instructors interact online. And these are all very meaningful. In terms of learner to content, I mean, this just gets into all those great instructional strategies, whether that's problem-based learning, which is what PBL is, using simulations or games, um, 
uh, employing application or having students produce something, maybe it's a lab environment or whatnot, and we will get in all into strategies and assessment methods that also facilitate learning. Okay, so if you're going to have um, forums, uh, a common question that I get is, um, how do I structure those or manage those? So um, you can, instead of just posting a question that probably every student will have the same answer to, that's, that is not engaging. You wanna use any discussions in a much more engaging way. So for example, um, there's a quote from a student where, in this class, the instructor identified, had group leaders who posted first, and then everyone else picked one of those initial responses to post to that and sort of broke off into smaller discussion groups so that rather than having to read like 20 or 30 posts, they were each reading five or six and interacting with a smaller group of students, you know, sort of like your breakout groups um, in a classroom. So it provides richer conversation, more depth. Some different strategies you could use here could include like having weekly discussion leaders, um, mapping out different student roles and rotating those roles among students. So some one week they may be a leader, next week a responder, next week they provide a summary of the discussion. Um, and then of course using small group discussions as well. So breaking students down into small groups. And this is just a, a range of different ideas for how to create more interactive forums. So um, I actually use my discussion forums in class for activities or practice or peer feedback. Um, you're seeing that this week in our class. If you notice the discussion uh, questions that I've posted are ones that you're all going to have different responses to. And we want to be reading each other's ideas and um, borrowing ideas and building off of each other and all of that. So you could have shoot, students share drafts in small groups and provide each other peer feedback and instructor feedback. Um, you could, um, I have a few classes where I have students create a visual or a concept map of key ideas and then we share that. Um, in one class, I actually do this as a before and after where I have them create something in week one or two and then we come back at the end of the course and I ask them to revisit what they created and revise that and post that um, and then discuss as part of our discussion. Um, in another class, I have videos um, where we do a case study. It's actually a whole series of videos where for four weeks we're working our way through um, a case study and then I add some additional features to that in week four for us to consider and they actually have to go through and do some analysis and discussion. And again, they're not they're not straightforward. Um, they're going to generate some similar ideas, but also some different ideas from that. And as they go, I want them to actually not just make a few comments, but I provide them detailed questions that I want them to respond to as part of their analysis of the case study. <clears throat> um, I also have a setting on those uh, when I do that case study where they cannot um, see other students' posts until they have posted their initial analysis of the case study. Um, so that way they're, you know, they may generate some things that are very similar, but in that particular instance, that's okay. Like I want them to see, okay, this is where we're identifying some things uh, the same things, and this is where maybe others are kicking up some additional thoughts. Um, you could provide students a document that they have to revise by applying the class principles. I see this a lot like in writing and, and um, grammar classes, uh, language learning, things like that. Um, or you could even ask the students to generate questions for the week based on questions that they have from the readings or the materials. Um, and sometimes I'll use that in combination, right? Like, you know, I'm not using the same approach to forums for every week throughout a class, depending on what I want us to accomplish that week or for a given uh, unit or something like that. I may use different strategies across the forums. 
And that's really nice because then your discussion forums aren't all looking the same. They're not highly formulaic um, and uh, they're much more interactive and they're getting the students to interact with the content in a meaningful way. Feedback I've mentioned before. Um, uh, let, me, let me start off by saying this about feedback. It took me a while, um, like a, like several years, to really kind of figure out my approach as an instructor. And my approach really hinges around feedback. I believe very strongly in providing um, uh, strategy-focused feedback to students. Um, the research supports this as a, a great learning um, strategy. But in order to employ this, my course kind of has to look a certain way. Feedback is really only useful for students when they have an opportunity to act on that. So I went back and really started rethinking my courses around how can I create opportunities throughout the class to provide students feedback in such a way that they can take that feedback and continue to work on their project or revise and resubmit. It does, um, it, it is more work <laughs> in some regards, although by recording videos and whatnot, I um, offload content delivery to the computer itself. And then that way I get to focus my interaction time with students on feedback. Um, so these are just a few quotes, again, about, uh, you know, this class is great because she provides me detailed feedback on meaningful assignments. Um, and both of those are important aspects here, you know, the assignments, assignments should be meaningful or relevant, um, and then providing detailed feedback. Um, the teachers of the class are supportive and interactive. Um, feedback was specific. Um, and then here we get into, you know, more feedback as well. Uh, this has a lot going on. You know, class was thoroughly laid out, you know, very organized. Um, I also appreciate a lot of teacher feedback on the posts and the assignments, um, which helped to create dialogue throughout the semester. So with, in terms of feedback, um, we want to give strategy focused feedback, like I've been saying, what is like, and that includes like, what is strong? Um, about your work, so keep doing this. What needs attention and how do you tend to that? Like give the learners um, some um, tips or strategies or things that they can use. Like, you know, this part was very underdeveloped. What if you also explained to me, you know, or go into detail about X or you didn't include this aspect. Consider why you might want to do X or explain to me in more detail how you would go about or why is this happening? Like explain to me, why are you observing what you're observing? Um, and the more you press on that, the more you, you may see that your learners don't understand something, which is great information to have so that you can adjust um, the nature of the instruction you're providing them. Um, we know that strategy-focused feedback tends to lead to um, better learning outcomes, more satisfaction, higher motivation, whereas error-focused feedback, which is solely, you know, you didn't get this right, or here are all the things that you got wrong, and this is why you don't get an A, you know, or something like that, that's all very demotivating, plus it doesn't help students learn. Um, so, uh, you know, again, if you're going through and editing like for grammar or formatting or something like that, I mean, some of it's just going to be error focused, um, but try to keep that to a real minimum and focus more on strategies. This really does reflect a changing role for us as instructors. I mean, for me, I went through my own change process as an instructor in terms of adapting to this um, uh, instructional approach. So like I said earlier, my time really shifted from being the source of content delivery. Like I get, like we are here, you know, I get all that recorded up front. Um, and then my time in class is really focused on discussions and feedback with students. So my time looks very different. What I look like as an instructor is very different. How I'm spending my time uh, is different. Um, and that all leads to a much more satisfying 
class, not just for the learners, but for me as well, because I feel like I get to know my students. The, when I made this pedagogical shift, not technological, when I made this pedagogical shift in my teaching, I felt like I get to know my students so much more. I know where they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, how they're progressing, what works in, time, in terms of how to support them on their path. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this, this different role. Um, some tools that you may use, and we'll talk about more tools as we get into it as well, um, especially in terms of assessment. We'll go into more detail there, but this can include um, most grading tools in learning management systems have provide you some ability to comment on submissions and provide written or maybe even audio feedback on work. I will use a mix of that just depending on which one I feel like is easier and more direct. Most of the time written comments or annotating something is um, straightforward enough. But sometimes I have feedback for students that I just feel like it's too complicated to type out. So I'll hit the record button and start recording my comments. And they love it because then it feels more personalized to them. Um, you may be providing feedback via discussions or maybe even use something like Zoom um, for live class meetings and office hours where you can provide students feedback there. Um, like I said elsewhere, in, some of, in one of my classes where I teach design, I set up small group meetings and call them design jams. And we get together and just go through people's work and talk about where they're at at that point and um, provide very informal, formative, supportive feedback. So lots of ways you can do this. Direct application is another important strategy that we see um, uh, arise time and time again. At this point, you may be starting to think, boy, this is not really terribly different from what I do in my classroom. And you would be right. There's so much about what's effective online that is really about just good pedagogy, good strategies. Um, so again, we've got some quotes here from students talking about, you know, I've been able to take what I'm learning here and apply it, uh, you know, things like that. Students are looking for relevance. So often when we talk about motivation, you know, I'll hear questions about, um, you know, my students aren't very motivated or whatever. Um, one of the key ways in which we can address motivation is to develop assignments and activities that our learners see as relevant, that could be relevant to the job that they're going to turn around and do, to their lives right now, to the situation going on around them. Um, it could be, you know, something that they see as immediately and practically applicable. So, and this also, um, developing strategies that focus on direct application help us take learning and move it from inert. Uh, in other words, it's kind of, it's, you know, they may know it and understand it, but it's just kind of stuck in the brain and they can't really do anything with it. Well, in order to help students do something with that knowledge, we have to give them practical opportunities for application. Um, where they can then take that knowledge and apply it. And we really will get into a lot of uh, ideas around this in our section on assessment. Another important aspect, which we'll also cover in more detail in this class, is uh, multimedia content. Um, so here are some you know, references. I really enjoyed the lectures with the audio over PowerPoint. Um, I like the fact that my professor records him teaching makes him sound like an actual class, not just online work for us to do. So in online, um, there are ways in which we wanna design it that's really effective, and uh, we will get into those principles in a separate day, in a separate video. Um, but uh, that's another way that you can, you as an instructor can create presence. So like even right now, like you're kind of getting to know me as a person, as an instructor by way of my videos and recording them. So even though I don't have my video on right now and you don't see me right now, you know, we had that earlier in an earlier video and you get to hear like, how does she intonate things? How does she emphasize things? So you're getting to know me as a person and as an instructor, and that's really important. But the multi multimedia content helps facilitate comprehension creates a sense of instructor presence, um, and the recordings provide really 
important flexibility. So we talked about flexibility earlier. We've talked about that throughout. I think flexibility is one of these principles from universal design that becomes really important as we think about how we design effective online learning. So I'm going to make a few comments real quick about synchronous and asynchronous just to make sure we're getting a few terms squared away. Asynchronous is not the same as self-paced as we talked about earlier. Self-paced means a learner is working through instruction entirely on their own pacing. Um, so you can have a class-paced learning environment that is asynchronous you can have a class-based learning environment that is synchronous and you can have a class-based learning environment that blends these two together. I think it's important to keep these terms straight as you go and as you work through planning. So asynchronous means different time, different place. Um, just like what we're doing in our discussion forums. Uh, you're each posting to those discussion forums um, at a different time and from a different place. Um, now, in a workshop setting, we've got a narrow amount of time, so the different time <laughs> may be uh, some of you are doing that at 12 p.m., whereas others are doing it at 11 a.m., but that's okay. That allows you to kind of structure things, read, digest, you know, do it your own way, post on your own time, um, but we're still doing it together as a class, as a group. Uh, this allows maximum flexibility. Um, especially, you know, the more that you have at asynchronous, say not just within a day, but across a week uh, or a month or a year. Um, and honestly, asynchronous tends to be best for adult learners, um, but also more for learners who are self-regulated. So that may be, um, you know, students who are in, uh, let's say grades five or six um, or older, um, who have at least some ability to self-regulate, um, uh, some presence, uh, some degree of asynchronous learning is going to be fine. My recommendation is that, you know, especially in times of crisis, when folks need maximum flexibility, anything that's required should be asynchronous, and then anything um, that is synchronous should be optional. Now, I understand with younger learners, like this, uh, this all starts to get a little bit more uh, difficult. So younger learners simply need more structure and synchronous provides that. So take my recommendation with a grain of salt here. Asynchronous uh, tools are really great. We talk about the idea of affordances. Asynchronous tools are really great for affording a lot more reflection deeper responses, longer responses. You don't have the time limitation of live discussions. And so you will often see more participation in asynchronous discussion um, of, of, of learners than, than you might in, uh, in a live session. Um, they're really good for group work and collaboration. Uh, I also use asynchronous for viewing recorded lectures and then any digital content as well. Synchronous means uh, different place, but same time. So Zoom uh, or other video conferencing tools are synchronous tools. Uh, I think this is better for younger learners or learners who are not as self-regulated yet, because like I said, synchronous time provides a lot of structure. And we know that structure is critical for especially younger learners or less self-regulated learners online. So my recommendation is that if you're planning, um, well, this is at the undergraduate level, um, to blend some synchronous sessions with asynchronous. If you're working with adult learners, like if you were to design something for the teachers um, or for your colleagues, you might want to make it more asynchronous. Whereas if you're designing for your students, um, especially younger students, you're going to want to use more synchronous as an anchoring component. So for example, the district that my kids are in, they're doing virtual learning, all virtual learning. They use a blend of synchronous and asynchronous where Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they have, uh, and my kids are in first grade, they have an hour and a half of synchronous sessions throughout the morning. Um, so that starts, you know, they start at 8.30 a.m. and then they have some different interactions throughout the day. They take breaks. 
um, during that time. And then the afternoon time is asynchronous. So they're given an activity to do or some activities to do like on an iPad or a tablet or something like that, that they have to either complete on the tablet or take a picture of it and submit that. Um, but that time is asynchronous. And so it's, it's more structured and more organized for younger learners, which is great, but it also gives them breathing time, a break from the screen, you know, time to move their little bodies around, and all of that's really important. As we start to talk about older learners, you can start to build in more asynchronous time. So I want to close with a few thoughts for you. Um, quality takes time, and innovation really does take patience. Just be patient with yourselves, with each other, with the students, with your parents. It will take time. Um, it takes us time to build a course, it takes us time to evolve the course and add to it and modify it, and it takes time to deliver a quality experience as well. And also exercising patience all around, whether this is with yourself or with others. Um, and that could mean patience because you may see dips in evaluations. We know that even in the best of times, when instructors try to be really innovative and try new things, not everything works. We may see um, dips in evaluations or negative feedback, but uh, you know, how can we be patient with the process? Um, also be patient with developing your own comfort and your own voice in teaching online. Like I said, it took me a ridiculously long time to really figure out who am I? as an online instructor. And I hope some of what I'm providing to you in this workshop helps you short circuit that <laughs> so, so you don't feel like it's going to take you quite a long time. But finding your comfort and your voice online will take time. So just be patient with yourself and then patience with transition periods for both instructors and students and parents as well. So I think the more that we can exercise uh, patience and recognize that building quality simply takes time, um, the more that we uh, will actually accomplish something wonderful.